All right, so tonight we're going to pick back up with the second part of uh, this study that we're in on how to uh, understand your Bible uh, for all it's worth and be able to get the most out of your Bible. Last week we, we talked about really the kind of the underpinnings of why it's important to do it. We got a little bit into the nuts and bolts and tonight, to be frank with you, it's gonna be all nuts and bolts the whole way through. And so we're gonna really get into some, uh, some uh, general principles that are going to help you in this uh, task of, of, of studying God's Word. And uh, like I said last week, that there are times when we get into it that it just becomes frustrating. And we don't know because we don't have the principles. Uh, we don't understand it. We don't have the tools uh, laid out for us. So we, we, get, we get bogged down in it. And so what I want to begin with tonight, kind of picking up from last week, is this first uh, part. And that is considering the context. Considering the context. There are there are some uh, general laws or, or principles that guide us when we interpret any kind of language. The first principle is to always pay attention to context. Context is usually focused on the portions that are surrounding the one area that you happen to be studying before, uh, before it and after it. The word context literally means what is with, con, the text. There are two levels of context typically recognized. The near or immediate uh, context is what comes just right before or right after the particular verse or maybe a paragraph or two. Uh, and then there is the far or remote context, and that might be the preceding chapter or the following uh, chapter or even some other part of the book that you may be in. Context has many forms. Uh, normally a word's meaning can only be understood within a particular sentence or paragraph. The sentence is then the context of the word. The same is true for a phrase. A, a sentence itself may even be obscure, and the paragraph or the section in which it is found is the context for that particular paragraph. So let's look at some guidelines for interpretation. And the first one that you need to write down is this. Think of all the possible meanings you can for the verse or word or phrase or sentence. You might think of one or, or, or even several. Write them all down. Remember I told you last week, have a, a notepad, a, a, uh, just a, a notebook beside you, paper, whatever, so that you can write these things down. So, so if you see any problems with a particular interpretation, write it down. It's always good to think clearly through possible meanings of a verse and, and write any uh, difficulties that you are thinking through about that. So the next step in this is to read the particular verse in its context. Y you need to get familiar with the content of the section in which your verse is found. So be sure that you include enough context. The first time, read it straight through. And don't spend any time trying to resolve any problems with a particular verse. Then, then go back and read it again much more carefully. And this time you need to note any connections that you see between words or, or thoughts. Next thing, study the verse more closely. Note connecting words. Often they're found at the very beginning of sentences. Being sure to see the connection that each connecting word establishes. So words like since then, or therefore, those are important connecting words. Fourth, note any main words that are repeated. Do not include common words like and and the. By the way, as I told you, if you had a concordance, if you get a concordance, the words and and the are in there. That would be the most ridiculous study you ever could employ to study all the uses of the word and or the in the Bible. Um, especially be alert for a word in the verse which is repeated in that particular verse's context. It may indicate a major theme. It might indicate relations to different parts of the book. 
Um, try to write the section, your, your verse and its context, try to write that in your own words. I do that every time I preach through a particular passage. I try to reword it. After I have studied that particular thing, I, after I've read it a million times, not literally, but a lot, then I will write it in my own words. Um, this will show you if you understand the section and you can express the thought clearly. And then sixth, try to answer the question, what does this verse actually mean in its context? And if you can't answer, then you still need to study. <laughs> there are difficult verses, however, on which even scholars have a lot of time to debate uh, particular things. So uh, be willing in your heart to leave some things with God. Um, he may very well illuminate it later for you. So let me give you um, an example of, of what I'm talking about. Here's um, a particular verse in your sheet there, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23. Paul says, everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible, permissible but not everything is constructive. So what is the possible meaning? Can the phrase... Everything is permissible, I mean there are no limitations on that. Just a question. Is everything permissible? He just said it was. Might not be beneficial, but it's permissible to murder your neighbor. <laughs> See, adultery, I'd, I'd say we could say, is probably not permissible. It, that is obviously, comparative with the whole counsel of God's word, that is obviously not the meaning. That everything is permissible with no limitations. So how do we know? Well, when you read the chapter in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, some things come to light immediately. Look at verses 6 through 8 that I've highlighted there for you. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were as it is written the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in pagan revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. As, as you read through chapter 10, you're going to see words like eat and drink occur multiple times in chapter 10. And they are linked with another word, partake. And when you study this chapter, and then verse 23, it becomes quite clear that Paul is addressing food that is sacrificed to idols. In verse 23, Paul is making a statement of contrast. Some things are permissible, but not beneficial. beneficial. And then in the following verses, he shows the concern about some things that are permissible, but not helpful. There are certain permissible practices, like eating food sacrificed to idols that have to actually be avoided because they hinder others and they do not promote the glory of God. So um, that's just an example of what I'm talking about. So let's move on uh, to another important uh, part of studying God's word and that's understanding the words. The second uh, general principle of interpretation is this. You, you interpret according to the correct meaning of words. This in and of itself is a challenge. Let me give you an example. When you hear the word trunk, I'm not going to say anything else. What just came to your mind? Okay. Who said car? Okay. Elephant? Okay. What about the word light? What comes to your mind? Okay. Okay. Right? Okay. Those are all very related themes. Okay. <laughs> okay. How about the opposite of heavy? 
Um, how about something that is pale in color? You see, the word itself, without understanding its meaning, can only be derived in the context. I just gave you the word without any context, and a whole bunch of ideas came out. But when you get that particular word in a sentence or in a paragraph or in a, a, another setting, you get to see what that word is actually meaning. So we have to see those words in their particular context. So let's, let's look through some of this and understand that words change their meaning over a period of time. We have a plethora of words that we have seen morph over time with usage. The word gay is a prime example. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15. For this we say unto you, this is from the King James. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. What? In the year 1600, in the 1600s in general, um, the word prevent meant go before. Today, the word prevent means stop. It means hinder. It is important that we interpret particular words according to their correct meaning originally. Um, here's another thought. Different words may have the same or similar meaning. So, when you ask someone, how are you feeling? And they respond, I'm feeling fine. Or they say, I'm feeling good. Does it really matter the difference between those two phrases? Because they just communicated the exact same thought. They've communicated that they are in good health. Oftentimes we use synonyms simply for variety. The Bible does the exact same thing. So not every time that a different word is used does it mean that there is a different meaning that is going to be found, if that makes sense to you. C, the Bible deals with many things that do not come into the ordinary thought of the world. The meanings of, of words as uh, people in the coffee shop use them may not be the same as people use those words in reference in per particular biblical passages. If I or you say someone uh, is just, or he is a just man, we typically mean that he is fair in his dealings. He, he's not a person that cheats. But when the Bible speaks of a believer in Christ being just before God, the meaning is very different than he's just a person that doesn't cheat. It is a legal term, and it comes right out of the courtroom. It literally means to be declared not guilty. So it means the believer has right standing before God based on the sacrifice and atoning work of Christ for his or her sins. Uh, the word just, if he is a just man, and you're using it in that context. Again, context is so critical. Here's another thought. The same word may have different meanings. Occasionally, different meanings may come even in the same passage. Frequently, the difference is between the literal and figurative uses. I give you an example here in Ezekiel chapter 44, verses 5 and 6. The Lord said to me, Son of man, mark well. See with your eyes and hear with your ears all that I say to you concerning all the statutes of the house, literal, of the Lord. And concerning all its laws, and mark well the entrance of the house with all exits of the sanctuary, you shall say to the rebellious ones, to the house, this is figurative, of Israel. Thus says the Lord God, enough of all your abominations, O house of Israel. The word house is literally referring to the temple in verse 5. It's, it's, it's to the literal temple, and then it's figuratively referring to all of the people of Israel. Some words gain 
more meaning from the Old Testament as they come into the New Testament. The word hope is a very good example of, of that thought. In the Old Testament, a believer's hope was a general a hope. The, the expectation that the, the future life would be something that would be blessed by God in, in some way. But in the New Testament, hope is used very frequently as referring to when Jesus comes back and he makes everything right. So, again, the, the, the word somewhat more from the Old Testament to the New Testament. So how do we, how do, we do this? How do we study the words? Well, let me, let me give you some steps on what to do as it, uh, as it comes to that. Number one, you, you need to look up the particular word that you're studying in a dictionary. Um, a dictionary, and, and I'm not talking about any kind of special Bible dictionary, I'm just talking about a dictionary. A dictionary can give two or more, sometimes even more than just two, uh, meanings of a word. Words are used in, in different ways. And a dictionary rarely tells which meaning is used in the Bible. Um, examining definitions helps us know all of the different possible meanings that a word can give to us. It gives us an idea of what it is that we need to be looking for. And remember last week as I, as I talked to you about this, just having a basic dictionary is one of the tools you need to have in your arsenal. Um, secondly, study the word in its context. And I want to go back on that, by the way. Mom, if you, that book, that dictionary I used, I was just looking at it, because I, I go to that dictionary a lot. I was looking in the front. That was your old dictionary that uh, way back in the day. And it's, it had a list of the presidents, and it was all the way current with Lyndon Johnson <laughs> when it was printed. So it's a, it's a little bit dated. But uh, anyways, um, so study, study the word in its context. Uh, the Bible is full of words whose meanings is, is made clear because of the context uh, that those words are in. If you notice a word whose meaning is not clear, you need to stop and consider the passage in which that word is, is actually located. And then third, use a concordance. Some words occur many times in the Bible, while others have only a few references. And all of those, whether it's many or whether it's just three, four times, that gives a, a clue as to how important the word is. Sometimes the word is important because it's repeated often in a particular passage over and over and over again. Uh, often it's also a very important word because it's used very infrequently. Um, uh, just an example, by the way, uh, the Gospel of John, uh, and I don't know if I clarify that in here anywhere, but I'm gonna go ahead and share it here. But the Gospel of John does not use the word miracle. He calls all of the miracles signs, and he only covers seven signs. The word seven, if you remember, is an important number um, in, uh, in Scripture. But uh, it's, it's interesting. There are seven signs that John covers in these miracles, and he's calling them a sign because they actually are like a, a billboard, in a way, of, of telling us something about Jesus, and each sign tells something different about who Jesus actually is. So it's, that's a really neat study, by the way, to do, to study the seven signs of John. I've, I've preached on that, I believe, way back in the day, but it's a, it's a really neat, uh, neat way to study Scripture, studying it in that context. There's a, there's a particular term, and you can write this down, but none of you are going to care. The term is hapax legomena. Hapax legomena means literally a, a word that is only used once in the whole Bible. And there are several of those. And so when you come across a hapax legomena, that's a theological scholarly term, but when you come across a word that is that rare, it's, it's, a, really, it's a really important word, and it's a word that you want to study. Um, and so uh, that's you know, that just keeping your head out, looking out for stuff like that. If you're studying a particular passage and you come across a word like, wow, that's a neat word, and you start looking into it. I don't have an example right now of a hapax legomena, but if you study a word like that, um, then you know, that can give you some real richness in, in, in your study and what you're doing. Um, so words, words are important. Words need to be studied. Um, and, and frankly, it's one of the best ways as you're studying Scripture to really begin to dig deeper into God's Word. So let's move past that now. Let's get into some things that some people, when they were in school or still are in school, they hate grammar. 
and studying and understanding grammar. So um, this, let, let, me, let me say this. This principle uh, literally could be stated this way. Interpret according to the grammar of a sentence. Grammar consists of two things. The form of words and the relationship of words. So, here we go. This is going to be a review for some of you. Know the elements of grammar. So if we are to interpret the Bible according to grammar, we need to know something about grammar. So I'm telling you, in your walk with Jesus Christ, those English classes that drove you crazy, they actually are something you will use. Just putting it out there. You need to understand the parts of speech. Nouns, verbs, pronouns, adjectives, adverbs, prepositions, conjunctions, interjections. The important thing is the way that each of those relates to the other words in a sentence and how the relationship actually affects the meaning. So let's look at verbs and their tenses. Uh, verbs are the action words of a sentence. We need to consider the tense of these words. I ate, I eat, I will eat. So let's look at past tense. A, a past tense may show that something happened once in the past. Romans chapter 7 verse 9. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. Past tense. Present tense. Present tense might actually communicate something that is a universal truth. One that is not limited to any particular time. John chapter 4, verse 24. God is spirit. And his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. That is present tense. And finally, future tense. The future tense normally tells what is going to happen in the future. John 14, verse 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back. And take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. So let's, let's move past the verbs and let's look at pronouns, genitives, and conjunctions. Anybody remember Schoolhouse Rock, conjunction, junction? What's your function? Uh, okay. <coughs> pronouns are simple words, but, uh, but we need to watch pronouns very carefully. Uh, a pronoun stands actually in place of a noun. In the sentence, Jesus came to Bethany, and on the next day, he entered Jerusalem. The pronoun he is standing for Jesus, and it's easy to see that. But there are times in the Bible when it's really not that easy to see who that pronoun is referring to or what that pronoun is referring to. So listen to this sentence. Jack went to Tom, and he gave him a book. Who gave who the book? Well, context is where we get our most help. Pronouns affect the meaning very much. There are times, especially in the prophetic books, where close study is needed to see who is the subject of the pronoun. There are also objective and subjective genitive combinations of words. Each begins with a noun that has some verbal idea in it, like love, love, fear, or call, a, prepos a preposition joins that noun with another, and it's called a genitive construction, such as the love of God. So the question is, is God loving, or is God being loved? Is he the subject, the one doing the loving, or the object, the one being loved. If God is the lover, it is a subjective genitive. If he is being loved, then it is an objective genitive. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. Is it Christ's love for us that compels us, which is subjective genitive, or... Our love for Christ, which is objective genitive, that compels us. 
you determine the answer by the particular context. This is, uh, you know, here I'm getting into the nuts and bolts and some of you, your eyes are beginning to glaze over on this stuff. <laughs> it's awesome. Conjunctions though, this is, this is good stuff. This is, this is the nitty gritty. This is how you study God's word, understanding these kinds of, of issues. Uh, conjunctions, the main connecting words and sentences are also very important. Think of a, a simple sentence. I eat vegetables and I am strong. Now think of the sentence with other words in place of and. I eat vegetables because I am strong. I eat vegetables when I am strong. I eat vegetables yet I am strong. I eat vegetables therefore I am strong. I eat vegetables although I am strong. The meaning changes each time because there's a, a little connecting word between those two parts of that sentence. So some, some guidelines in helping as we kind of go through on this particular thing. Number one, where the meaning of a verse or passage is not clear, identify the key word and label it grammatically. That is, what part of speech is it and how is that word related to other words? Is it a noun? Is it a pronoun? Is it a verb? And then secondly, study the relation of that particular word to the other words that are around it. Third, note the possible meanings that it may give the section that you are studying. And finally, if there is more than one possible meaning, consider other principles, especially always context. Now, let's move on beyond the grammar and get into something that might be a little bit more uh, interesting to you, grasping the author's intention. Uh, and I would state maybe this principle this way. Interpret according to the author's purpose and plan. Look at 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. John clearly is stating why he is writing this letter right there in that verse. The plan of the author is the way he structures his writing in order to carry out his purpose. So let's look first at the author's purpose. John chapter 20, verse 31. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So, John described Jesus' Jesus' miracles so that people would come to believe on Jesus as the Son of God, his person, and that through faith they would receive eternal life. That's salvation. So knowing John's purpose then helps us see the, the spiritual thrust of what he is writing and how he is structuring his writing. That's his purpose and how he structures. Remember I just told you the seven signs of John. What is his purpose? That you may believe that Jesus is the Christ and that you may have salvation by believing in his name. That's his purpose. So when he structures his letter, it's all going back to helping you understand my purpose. So secondly, the author's plan. An example of interpreting in light of the author's plan can be found in the book of Genesis. Uh, as you read through the book of Genesis, you see this particular phrase. It's used all the time. This is the account of, and then a list. This is the account of Adam. This is the account of Noah. So you, you got that phrase appearing just multiple times. Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. Genesis chapter 5, verse 1. Genesis 6, verse 9. Genesis 10, 11. Genesis 11, 10. It, it, it shows up multiple times. So that's not, not exhaustive, by the way. But all of those occurrences mean that it cannot be accidental. He's not just saying something to say it. What is the significance? And how is it that that phrase can help me understand the book of Genesis? And to see the force of the phrase in each reference, then I would want to maybe make a, a table, uh, like draw some boxes, and, and I'd have columns, and I would list relevant facts with each occurrence. When it says this phrase, this is the account of, well, I would want to know um, who is he mentioning when he uses that phrase? What is the content of, or section actually about? Is it a, a personal story? Or is it just genealogical information? 
And what is the link? Is it a short reference or is it a long reference? So as you study, various facts will come to light. For example, Genesis has two different parts, really. The first part goes all the way up to chapter 12, and that's up to Abraham. And the second part is Abraham and the patriarchs that come after him, which is Isaac and Jacob. And so um, you, you kind of follow through those stories uh, as you study through uh, Genesis. The first part of Genesis, before Abraham, is really heavy on genealogies. The second part is way more focused on personal stories. So where the purpose and or plan of a book can be known, we are to interpret that book according to the various passages in that light, where we know what the author's intent is, what his plan, what his purpose is. So how do we do that? How do we find purpose? How do we find plan? Well, here's the first thing. Note whether the purpose is actually stated or not. If it's not stated, are there any hints to it as you read through the letter? Paul doesn't state his purpose clearly in, in his letters uh, to the Corinthians in particular. If you read through those letters, though, you get a sense of what his purpose actually is and what it is that he is addressing. But typically... There are good indicators for understanding the author's purpose for writing. Secondly, personal references to the readers usually can help you indicate the author's purpose. Matthew wrote his gospel partly at least to set forth the truth about the kingdom of heaven since he refers to the kingdom of heaven so many times. And then third, you need to look for how the book is actually structured. There might be very clear division points. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, is a very clear dividing point in the book of Romans. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, is a very clear dividing point in the book of Ephesians. And then when the purpose and or plan is clear... Then study each portion of the book with that in mind, being sure that your interpretation is squaring with the author's intent. So let's move on beyond that to studying the background. The next principle can be simply stated to interpret in light of the historical, geographical, and cultural background as far as that can be known. Events in the Bible took place in actual points in history. So the first and primary meaning of a passage is what did it mean in its particular historical content, context? That is, what it would have meant to the people that were living at that particular time. So, learning background. This is, this is where a Bible background book is going to be very helpful to you. Commentaries, Bible dictionaries are going to really help draw all of this out. Number one is for you to simply learn the Bible. Read, read, read the Bible. The more you are familiar with the entire Bible, the more you will have background and knowledge to help you in your interpretation as you try to study passages. Second, and I've said this before many times, make notes as you read. Write down details about Bible characters or customs, the features of the land. Note unusual things, strange words. Third, if you have a Bible with marginal references, use those marginal references. Often New Testament verses have their link back to an Old Testament reference. And then fourth, use the maps in your Bible to look at uh, geographical points when it's talking about a particular place. Try to find that. Look at that so you have kind of a visual idea. For example, as you, if you read Joshua... Then look up all of the places that are mentioned in Joshua. You'll kind of understand the plan that God had of the conquest of the land of Canaan. So let's, uh, let's consider some interpretation guidelines for uh, this understanding the background. Number one, carefully consider any points that are unknown or confusing in the passage and note how a knowledge of the background is really helpful in understanding them. Second, determine what the passage must have meant to the people in that particular setting. And third, 
C, to understand what meaning is relevant for us today in our culture and then make an appropriate application. And now let's, let's talk finally about interpreting scripture by scripture. And I would state the principle this way. Interpret each passage in light of the Bible's teaching as a whole. Uh, the Bible does not contradict itself. The Bible is essentially one revelation giving one message about God. We already understand that a verse or a passage may be studied in its particular context, the verses that, that, that are right around that particular passage. But, but the implication of this particular principle is that the entire Bible is the ultimate context of whatever you're studying. The message of the Bible on a particular subject can be found only by studying all the passages relating to it. If we study only some of the passage, then we may fail to understand what the Bible has to say. Suppose you're going through a jungle. Cutting across your path is a river that is difficult to cross. And if you know nothing about that general area, you will try to cross the river. But if you know that area well, you'll know that a quarter of a mile to the right, the river makes a bend and it reverses its direction. And you can simply walk around the bend. General knowledge can save a lot of difficulty and even danger. Heresies and false doctrines seem to have biblical authority because those who teach them use only certain passages, but they ignore many others. We can be kept from believing wrong doctrine by checking our understanding of a verse by the message of the entire Bible. 